Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, fellow forgiven sinners, in Jesus' name. The basis for the sermon today comes from the gospel lesson we just heard moments ago. I'll read it for your consideration one more time as we work through it together. From Matthew 23 on page 10. Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, The teachers of the law and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat, so you must be careful to do everything they tell you. But do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they preach. They tie up heavy, cumbersome loads and put them on other people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. Everything they do is done for people to see, They make their phylacteries wide and the tassels on their garments long. They love the place of honor at banquets and the most important seats in the synagogues. They love to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and to be called rabbi by others. But you are not to be called rabbi, for you have one teacher and you are all brothers. And do not call anyone on earth father, for you have one father and he is in heaven Nor are you to be called instructors, for you have one instructor, the Messiah. The greatest among you will be your servant. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Do you know any good Pharisee stories? Maybe it almost tells like a joke. The, the, the stories where uh, Jesus went to that tax collector's house named Matthew and had dinner with him. And, and, and mind you, the, the tax collectors are those ones who use their position as servants of the people, servants of the government, the ones who use them for their own personal gain and for their pocketbook. Jesus sat down at the dinner table of this Matthew, this tax collector, and the Pharisees, Well, they put up a riot outside of his house. Jesus, you claim to be the one who delivers and frees people from all that is wrong in this world. You claim to be the son of God, and yet you demote yourself to sit at the dinner table of a sinner? Or or how about the story of a Pharisee where Jesus is no longer sitting with a tax collector, but at the dinner table of a Pharisee, a man named Simon, And Jesus, he certainly was something of a celebrity, something that got the people talking and motivated. And so to have Jesus in your house, even as a Pharisee, was an honor. You wanted everything to go well. But as Jesus reclines at the table, a woman bursts through the door, weeping, having an emotional breakout, the tears falling on Jesus' feet, those ceremonially washed feet being in the the place of a Pharisee, obeying God's law, taking care of your body, just as God had said. And here's this woman crying on your feet, wiping them with her hair, pouring perfume on top of them. And Simon, this Pharisee, was angry confused and angry why, why he would allow such a, a deprived woman to be in his presence. Why Jesus didn't just kick her away. Or maybe if you're thinking of, of, of Pharisee stories, you might think of the most important, most profound Pharisee in God's word. A man who grew up in the church. A man who w- would have been on the wall of fame for catechism students those who learn the truths of God's word, who, who learned God's law, who had a zeal for God's law, who wanted to do what God wanted them to do. A Pharisee named by the name of Saul, the one who wrote many of the New Testament books, letters that we have today. And this Saul who had such a great zeal for God's law and its power to to. to, to fulfill what God wanted done in our lives. He went to the fullest extent of persecuting, even killing those followers of Jesus, those ones who would empty God's precious law of its power. Do you know any good Pharisee stories? So you may get the impression from those little snippets or... or, or, uh, Stories you yourselves know from God's word of Pharisees that these Pharisees really were a stick in the mud. 
through much of Jesus' ministry. They were his busy, biggest critics. And perhaps it would be a benefit for, of, for us to just understand who these Pharisees were, where they came from. To be a Pharisee meant you belonged to a Jewish religious sect, one that had its origins in the remnant, that was the Israel that was living in the land of Judah, carried away by the Babylonians. Fifty years so or so later, they came back to God's promised land. And they were wrestling with this idea, are we God's people? Does God love us? How could such a thing happen to us that God's people could be carried away from their home? And it was the Pharisees who said, God's law. We need to act as God's people if God would continue to preserve us and keep us as his people. 500 years before Jesus ever came to this earth, this pharisaical idea began. It's one that still lays the foundations of rabbinic Judaism today. The focus was on the Torah, those first five books of the Bible. Those Pharisees, with great zeal, wanted to know God's law. They loved God's law. They cared about God's law in the most sincere fashion. Really, if you had to sum it all up, the Pharisees were all about great morals, great ethics. They didn't carry the connotation that you and I carry of a, of a Pharisee today. No, the Pharisees were the people you wanted to be. As a, as a Jewish father, you wish that your daughter would, would meet a, a nice Pharisee boy who would respect her and take care of her and always follow what it meant to be a husband and a wife. These were the Pharisees. And through that, because of that, your adherence and how you treated one another, it was really indicative of how you thought of yourself before God. And if you want to be in God's presence, you have to follow his law. It was as simple as that for those Pharisees. So, we might begin to understand why the Pharisees would get so upset at Jesus for hanging around sinners, those with loose moral law and moral code. Those sinners weren't like the Pharisees. They didn't show their care and concern for God's word for his desire among his people. Of course, how could God not cast his judgment down upon you if you didn't care for what he had in store for you, caring for his law? But there's a problem in that. Is that if you read throughout scripture and especially through the gospels, this pharisaical idea or this pharisaical group, Jesus had a problem with them. They were more times than not opposed to Jesus. It's because of words like you heard this morning from our gospel from Matthew 23. Jesus calls them a bunch of hypocrites. They didn't practice what they preached. But it's a good thing that you and I don't have to worry about that today, right? Or do we? Even as Bible-believing, inherent word of God, not word of man, word of God, Bible-believing Christians? Not the case. Do you have any good Pharisee stories? Today in our gospel, Jesus has some very harsh words for the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. And with those words of caution, he cautions us as well to examine our attitude in, in, in that of God's law, in that of our relationship with God. Here once again, those opening words that Jesus speaks to his disciples and those around him. Speaking about the teachers of the law and the Pharisees, they sit in Moses' seat. So you must be careful to do everything they tell you. But do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they preach. Does that strike you as it strikes me? Do you understand what Jesus is asking his disciples to do? To listen to these no good, legalistic, self-righteous Pharisees. That they sit in 
Moses' seat with this caveat. Don't do what they do. It's not that the Pharisees were entirely wrong and that there was no good use for the teaching and the, the expectations that they had for themselves and for one another. After all, it was God who put them into this seat of Moses. They had God's authority to preach and to proclaim what God said to be true. But they didn't put it into practice. Instead, they, they, in, in reverence out of the law, they put the law on other people. As Jesus says there, this large, cumbersome load, a heavy burden of God's law, this is how you get right with God. If you have issues with your brother, sister, father, mother, employer, God's law has the answer. You keep his commands. We'll even throw extra laws on top of it just to make sure that we really revere and keep holy God's reverent law as he speaks to you and to me. After all, how powerful is that? But the problem was, that those Pharisees weren't willing or, or even able to lift a finger to help anyone else. They couldn't offer any comfort. Instead, they just laid on demand after demand, burden after burden, that the only relief would come in the fulfillment of that law, in doing as you're told, not as I say, but as God says. They made, the, and the Pharisees, whose job it was to read the law, to listen to the law, to practice to the law, they loved this way of thinking. Because they could walk around acting as if God's law and, and obeying it was a piece of cake. After all, they loved God. And they also loved showing off just how much they loved God. They would love to go out and have everybody look at them and say, hey, how great and wonderful are those Pharisees. If there were more of them around, life would be a lot better for the rest of us too. They loved to to widen their phylacteries, these boxes that were worn around their head, little strips of Bible passages from the Torah placed in these little little boxes. This beautiful symbolism that as God speaks, he is close to us through his word. Nothing wrong by that by itself. In fact, it comes right from God's word as a command. They were fulfilling that law. But the Pharisees would make them big, ornate, and say, look at me. Look how good and godly I am with these long flowing robes, how much I stick out based on how I observe God's law. Of course, the places of honor in the marketplaces and in the places of worship, those would just come naturally. Of course, I would take them as well. Loving the titles of rabbi and teacher, they love the praise from men. That's what they lived for. But it was all just on the outside. It's kind of like when you go to empty out your dishwasher after you've run it on the power plus cycle and you open it up and the nice warm breeze comes out of the dishwasher and you're expecting everything to be nice and clean. Everything has followed and happened just as it was supposed to until you pick up one of the bowls and and turn it over and there's last night's supper still stuck on the back. Uh, Or you take out the, the glass and you fill it full of water and you see all of the little squigglies inside of it. It really didn't get the job done. The Pharisees look good on the outside. Even in their heart of hearts, they believed what they were doing was right and good and upright and just. But on the inside was something that you and I deal with as well, just like those Pharisees. Self-righteousness. Finding our meaning, our purpose, our worth, and the ability to show others and ultimately to show ourselves just how good of a Christian they could be. See, they really didn't practice what they preached. They, they taught that, that in order to get God's love, 
there has to be something on your part. Otherwise, it just falls to the wayside. And what good and power is that? But they forgot that obedience to God's law has one final clause at the end. If you want to live in a relationship with God based on the law, no matter how good and perfect and holy it is, keep it all. Keep it perfectly. No excuses. No better than the person next to you, than the sinners and the tax collectors that would be around. Keep it perfectly from the greatest of the least of those under the law, perfection is what God demands. And they weren't. And they thought that they could be righteous before God uh, based on what they did and their best efforts, most sincere. They had God. They had the Lord and his law. What they didn't have is the Lord and his promises. Those are their stories. Do you know any good Pharisee stories? Maybe you've heard the, the story of the Pharisee who, who brings his family to church every Sunday. And not just him, but his whole family as well, all dressed to the nines, wearing smiles on their faces. But it's all just a cover of the heartbreak and loss that there was at home. After all, church is the most social event of the week and we have to put on some sort of face, right? That's what a Christian ought to be. Or maybe you've heard the story about the Pharisee who, who comes to church, does the, the God thing just enough so that his pastor or the elders in the congregation don't come knocking. And if you're asking just how many times that might be, you're asking the wrong question. Maybe you've heard the story of the Pharisee who has the expectations of perfection over everything and everyone in his life and how good and perfect it would all be if those expectations would be met every once in a while. Go to the nice job, expect to come home, maybe not to perfection, but at least a little better than most. And yet this perfect person, this Pharisee, who expects perfection has no joy or peace in their life because they're constantly stressed out. Because of that incessant desire inside you and me to only want more. One success leads to another set of successes. Leads to burnout and worry. Wondering if they've done enough Swimming in a pool of doubt and uncertainty. Maybe the story of the Pharisee is the one who goes out and proclaims love and acceptance so long as that view is in line with my own or makes sense to me. The one who goes out of their way to avoid anybody who doesn't look or act like me. How about that Pharisee story? The neighbor who says they're Bible-believing, but, but just so that they don't get trampled on too much as a poor, weak Christian follower of Jesus? I got to tell other people about the grudges that I hold. The, the little bit of power that I still have over other people's life while it eats them inside and becomes a mess. Maybe it's the story of the simple Pharisee who asks, how are things going? It's great, hunky-dory, nothing but, but goodness, and, and, and it's going, you know, okay. While on the inside, it's so full of guilt and shame and regret. All because of those couple of instances I just can't let go of. Have you ever heard of those Pharisee stories? It's because they're yours. Just like they're mine. There are plenty more Pharisee stories that we could talk about this morning. This not practicing what you preach 
this set of expectations that we have to do something about. Whether change them, alter them, lower them, throw them out altogether, and life is what you make it. We are those Christians, even gathering around God's word in, in, in incessant need for rest. We sometimes wrestle with this attitude of hypocrisy. And it's not wrong to point out the sin in another person or to, to point out the sin within our own hearts. It's, it's not wrong to, to strive to live a God-pleasing life or to be disgusted over those who have loose morals who the results of their actions have led to chaos and despair. It's not wrong of us to act like we have it all together, to to rather encourage others to live a God-pleasing life too. But when you think that your obedience to your own set of standards or ultimately God's has any bearing on the relationship that you share with God, you begin to believe and look at how other people are just a little less godly than you or when you really start to uncover the lie in our own hearts that this is why God loves me then the Pharisee inside of you and me comes alive it's practicing what we preach and you saw it maybe in the bulletin there the theme for the sermon, it's not a typo. Practice who you preach. And as we live under this desire in each of our hearts to be measured and our worth and our, our, our ability by a standard, we are simply practicing or practicing who we preach, and that's ourselves. Our ability opposed to another our righteousness and holiness before God as opposed to those who don't deserve it. Practicing what you preach ultimately gets back to who is preached. And so for one final time here, what's the burden? Heavy on your shoulders this morning. What's the burden that you're shoving onto another person's shoulders? The expectations of perfection that clearly are not being met. What's the guilt or the unachievable expectations that you have in your relationship with one another and ultimately with God? The truth is you have a Savior. Just to be very clear, let's be very clear about who that is. He's not a token on your desk. Someone you know when times go flat. Someone to praise when times are high. He's not someone that that we can pull over ourselves in order to to bring glory and honor to ourselves. He's a Savior. And I'll simply ask you, what good is a Savior without sin? What good is a, a good and almighty God if we are the ones who need to be constantly in control and there is never any conflict? And understand me well. I'm not saying go and sin because you'll see your Savior greater. Or go and and live a life out of control because God has it all in control. You have a Savior. A God who not only just shows love or who can receive love, but who is love. It's that God of love who sent this Savior. And his name is Jesus who came to bear the burdens that you and I carry around each day, the ones we know and the ones we have yet to know. The Savior Jesus, who who tells us just chapters before in Matthew 11, come to me, all you who are wearied and burdened, and I will give you rest. Not rest from the expectations that you set upon yourself, but the ones that that do not show favoritism the expectations of perfection of God's law. Know that so that you can know your Savior. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, Jesus says, for I am gentle and humble and heart and you you will find rest 
for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. This is really what Jesus is getting back to when he speaks at the end of our gospel lesson. How you don't have many rabbis, but one rabbi, one teacher, one instructor who does not simply bring you before him to chase you around. You ought to do better. Listen to God's law more. Listen to my sacrifice for you. Listen and hear what true humility is to be God as he rightfully is and to humble himself in order that he might have you. This is the gospel that brings joy and peace. Not to save us from our burdens, but to carry us through them. As you come each week into this place, Confessing your sins. Not as a show. Not as a a thoughtless practice that just goes by the wayside. But calling God true and trustworthy. A damnable creature. Saved by grace. So how do you get rid of this pharisaical attitude? The one that we see perversing all assets, aspects of our society and world, every aspect of our brain and our heart and our desires. Practice who you preach. Practice who you know yourself to be, not by your own revelation, but by God's. The gospel message of Jesus Christ, who gave himself for you to take the burden of sin away from you and to give you something to really be proud of. Humility, life, forgiveness, in the everlasting name of Jesus our Lord. Amen.